Um, raise your hand if you've spoken to me or we've met so far this week. Inner Sanctum, I see a couple hands. Good, then hopefully for most of you this will be new <laughs> information. Um, and I'm really hoping that the story I'm gonna tell today that you have not heard. And I'm here to talk to you about the A&W business in the United States. I'll get to a little bit of that later. Um, but I'm gonna be telling you about a 100-year-old startup, and that's A&W in the US. A lesson in storytelling that we've learned, um, some critical mistakes that have been made in the past, and the learnings that we've brought from those, and how we've leveraged content from our fans and turning them into lifetime ad advocates. So, um, they asked me to tell you a little bit about myself. So I'm from the great state of Kentucky. I don't know if anyone's from Kentucky. I think I met one other person this week. Um, and like a good Kentucky girl, I love bourbon. I was very surprised to see so few bourbons up in Canada, because in Kentucky, that's like pretty much all you can buy. So that was very refreshing. Um, also a huge college basketball fan. I'm a huge diehard Kentucky Wildcats fan. Whoop whoop. Um, and some really other random facts about me is I became a firefighter in high school and college because my hashtag girl dad had been one and I knew as a young child I wanted to be just like him when I grew up. I also loved to sing, so I tried out for American Idol. Fun fact, my husband didn't know that. Um, and I was running through my presentation. He was like, I didn't know you. He was like, do I even know you? I was like, <laughs> Yes, um, clearly didn't make it very far, because I'm here with you today. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, Sam was like, what the fuck? <laughs> um, so I can truly attest that auditioning for American Idol in front of an arena with thousands of people is scarier than running into a burning building. I don't know how many people can say that, but I can test to it, it's 100% true. Um, I also went to college for engineering. Um, I was good at math and science, and at the time, everyone was like, oh, you should be an engineer, you're a woman, you're gonna make so much money. Um, but I quickly realized, after like my first day in engineering school, that I was not like these people. <laughs> we, took a, we took a personality test, and everyone was given a sociability rating, and mine was like an 85% out of 100. And the person to the right and left of me were like 15% out of 100, and I was like, okay, these are not my people. <laughs> Um, but much to the grin, chagrin of my mother, um, who only recognizes five careers, which is doctors, lawyers, engineers, accountants, and teachers, as real careers, I came out of college with a marketing degree, and my mom still to this day has no idea what I do. So that's a little bit about me, um, my personal life. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my, about my career, because um, this is kind of the first question that anybody's asked me, is like, where did you get your start? And for me, I literally started at the bottom. And most people talk about their career as if it's maybe like a chart up the mountain, and mine has felt more like a roller coaster. And I mean that in the best way possible. I actually started at the very bottom as an intern at KFC and Yum Brands, and I spent the last 13 years working through almost every discipline within the marketing team. So I'm gonna share a little bit of my learnings with you today. Um, as an intern, I started off in Consumer Insights, which I think is the best background uh, foundation that I could have had. Um, I was right out of undergrad, and my first budget was a million dollars, and I thought, <laughs> this is a shitload of money to give someone who just graduated college, especially someone who didn't come out with a research background. Um, but again, best foundation I could have asked for. We're talking about marketing and research and understanding how consumers think, and really those insights that are gonna make, what can we make actionable to build our brands? My favorite part of the job in CI was that my particular role was specifically on a special project team with, within R&D. And I can attest to a person, as a person who loves to eat, I mean loves to eat, there's no better career than being able to work daily with some of the top chefs in the industry. Very blessed, very, again, <laughs> talk about college, freshman 15, I gained like first job, freshman 40. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So in a drastic change, I moved to the field marketing team and I could not have been less prepared for this job. Um, I was running, I was selling in media plans for three of our company store markets, which included our headquarter market for KFC during at the time, which was their most extensive product rollout, grilled chicken. Um, I could talk to you <laughs> all day about the mistakes made with that program, um, but it's this point that I learned to negotiate and connect directly with franchisees. Anyone here in a franchise business? We have franchisees. I've talked to several of you. 
Um, it is its own unique beast. Um, but at this time, I joined the A&W brand, which at the time was still under Yum Brand's umbrella. Um, and I really fell in love with the legacy of the A&W brand and the potential that it had um, to be a great American brand. So after a few months in field marketing, I was moved to merchandising where I learned creative strategy. Um, at, the, at, the, at this point in time, I was only working on menu boards, um, which is still today my least favorite part of my job. Uh, I equate it to the crust of the pizza. So if marketing's the pizza, I don't like the crust very much, but I still love pizza and can't have one without the other. Um, so the menu board strategy really is like the lowest common denominator in the restaurant. It's the one thing that all of your consumers should see when they enter the restaurant. And I, a very smart person once told me, if you can understand menu boards in the restaurant industry, you will always have a job. So I still work on menu boards even though I hate them. <laughs> Uh, next big challenge came um, with social. I was the um, first brand manager for our social accounts, first social media media buys. I managed all the guest relations. Um, and at this point, even though I was relatively junior um, in the organization, the organization obviously had very strict hierarchies, huge corporate giants. Um, our CMO at the time allowed me to create my own title as chief listening officer. I don't think I was the first chief listening officer, but I did think this was like the coolest title ever because there weren't a lot of these at the time. Um, so I was blessed for that. And then as a side job, I was still running the creative process, working directly with the brand managers to man manage sales events, market tests. And it was at this point that I realized and wanted to become a brand manager, I thought it was the absolute best job in the world because you were able to work within all of the other dis disciplines within marketing, all the cross-functional teams. I worked my way up to being one, and years later, I still consider myself a brand manager and a steward of the entire marketing mix. Last but not least, I know you don't want to hear any more about me, um, I recently taken on my greatest challenge, which is franchise development and sales. And I can honestly say that I wake up each day <laughs> saying, shit, <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. How did I get myself into this? Uh, but I've always been up for a challenge, and I've said to myself so many, in my career, uh, so many times in my career, just dig deep and figure it out. So I've been really blessed uh, to work with some amazing mentors every step along the way, um, really, really smart people that I've been able to learn from, including our franchisees. Uh, so I love the people I work with, I love this brand, and I'm thankful to be able to share a little bit of our story with you today. So, about a and and what I'm here to talk to you about. Um, I'll start by saying the a and brand is a little bit complicated. We're located in eight different countries. We've got US, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Japan, Singapore, Bangladesh, and Canada. Canada is the only op country that is separately owned and operated. And I can also speak to you all day about the legacy of a w in our ASEAN countries, but for the purpose of today's session, I'm going to focus on a w in the US. So I'll try to distill 100 years, or actually 101 years, of history in a very short minutes. a w was founded in June of 1919 when a man named Roy Allen served root beer at a parade for returning World War I veterans. Allen quickly took on a partner, Frank Wright, which a w stand for. Allen and Wright, and they began expanding to more and more root beer stands as the brand grew. I'm going to be showing you a lot of pictures today because um, I love the architecture. I'm a low-key architecture buff, so I think these are fun. Um, as the brand grew, it began franchising, so we're actually the first franchised restaurant chain in the, in the U.S. as well. The brand survived world wars, sugar rationing, prohibition, despite having the word beer in the name of its signature product. Um, and you'll see in this picture, it was very common to show the menu um, hand-painted on the building, either the awnings, um, lots of walk-up windows. Um, a and W's big boom was in the 50s and 60s when returning World War, I, World War II veterans uh, used their GI loans to open up restaurants in their hometowns. So we were literally the American dream. We ballooned up to approximately 2,500 locations in the 1970s. Um, again, wanting to show some of the uniqueness of the brand in pictures, um, we start, first started with root beer stands that relied solely on walk-up windows. Um, and with the rise of automobiles, we started building drive-in restaurants. Uh, we were immediately steeped in car culture of America. 
These drive-ins consisted of very long canopy overhangs. You would park your car, you'd order through a speaker system, car hops would bring trays of food right out to your car. Uh, besides showing off hot rods, a and became a place to hang out after school, after varsity football games. It was a place you took your first date. Uh, this is fun. Uh, this is a pagoda roof style, which you can still see peppered across the country. At one point, someone had the brilliant idea to paint them all turquoise uh, instead of orange, which was the brand color. Um, so at one point in our history, we had to have everyone paint your orange roof turquoise, and then like a couple years later, paint your turquoise roof orange. So as you can see, it's a, we've bounced around a lot. I love this roof design. Um, I just think it's super cool. Uh, but we also had root beer stands built to look like lighthouses or giant root beer barrels. Um, there's one that I've seen that was a giant Native American like headdress. Um, crazy, crazy looking architecture uh, and some really truly wonderful mid-century modern building designs. And then came ownership changes, and the brand started being tossed around. Ten ownership changes. The rights to a w Root Beer, can and bottles, were spun off. And over decades, new development strategies brought us into different type of restaurant designs. Um, we went into malls and built kiosks. We had large sit-down restaurants that didn't have drive throughs They didn't have menu boards. You had a menu at the table that you would order. You actually could pick up a phone and order directly from your table and reach the kitchen in the back. Um, we started building in gas stations. We started co-branding locations um, with other chains, KFC and Long John Silver specifically. And then December 19th, 2011, we were spun off for the final time from Yum Brands, and that's where today's story really begins. We started over. We were 92 years old when we left the world's largest restaurant company, and we had eight employees, eight people when we left and I was one of them. Uh, we quickly hired seven more people <laughs> um, to bring us up to like 15 or 16 people. Um, we'll say 15, because that's, that's not a round number, but it's a round number. And our first meeting um, was sitting around a conference table room in temporary office space, and it did not look like this. It looked more like this, um, except to throw two more like, crappy chairs in that little space, what we would have given for a WeWork. Um, we literally had to start over from 92 years old and our very, very, very first goal was just to make payroll. Crazy. Another interesting fact is we have very little archives left. So imagine being 100 years old and having very little to show for it. The brand had, had been bought and sold so many times. You guys know when you move house, you kind of clean out the clutter because you don't want to move all those things. Um, so much of our items had been thrown out or given away. Um, so we're actually probably the largest buyer of a &W memorabilia on eBay right now, which is kind of funny. I've got all my a &W eBay alerts. <laughs> so we didn't have much, but what we left with was a brand that had 98% aided brand awareness, a extremely passionate baby boomer fan base that literally grew up with the brand, and this will be important later. Um, we also had a signature product that literally no competitor had, and our root beer was still being made fresh in many, not all, but many restaurants. We also had a system of dedicated owner operators. We are a franchisee owned brand now. So that changes how we approach our business because we have to be lockstep with our franchisees every step of the way. And our franchisees, our owners, are the heart and soul of the brand. Pretty much the only reason it survived this long. Uh, really, really hardworking people, caring, and they wanted to see the brand succeed. We also had a support center team, although it's only 15 people at this point, that desperately cared about the brand. We learned a lot in a very short period of time, and I'd like to share those learnings with you today. Our learnings start here with data, only f to point out that my biggest gripe with marketing today is that we're talking too much about data. I'm not saying data is not important, because it clearly is. Um, we're always looking for new technology um, to implement in our business. But it's like we have data coming out of every orifice. We're producing and consuming data at a rate that is nearly impossible to keep up with. All of this is very exciting, well and good, but we can't do our jobs without data. But what, at what point did we stop talking about storytelling? Because we're marketers. Shouldn't that be just as important? Maybe not more important than data, but as important? 
So what we've learned as a brand is, as an organization, if you don't tell your story, it gets lost. So I'm giving you a short lesson in storytelling from a 101-year-old brand. So let's start with the definition of storytelling. You guys, it's very simple. It's the activity of telling or writing stories, and it comes in very different forms. Um, petroglyphs, our ancient ancestors, didn't need words to tell the story. They could simply do it with simple drawn figures. I was going to put a Game of Thrones reference in there. Um, <laughs> this is one of my favorite scenes of Game of Thrones, discovering the cave drawings. Um, but fast way forward to modern times, we still didn't need words to tell a story. It certainly makes it easier when we do use words, either through poems, novels, music, theater. Um, it's used as a way of bringing people together. We all remember the first movies we saw. Um, even music videos nowadays relay a story. We can feel happiness, sadness, joy, pain from the stories that we consume. And at A&W, we had no shortage of stories to tell. We were known for our root beer, made fresh in each restaurant with a big kettle, stirred a little bit of a time with a big paddle. It took hours to make. You'd stir a little bit, you'd go make burgers, you'd come back and you'd stir a little bit, you'd go make hot dogs. And it could take four hours to make a batch of fresh root beer. We also had no shortage of visual cues highlighting the importance of the root beer brand to the a w brand's heritage. These are some old school frequency cards. Also had to buy these off eBay. <laughs> um, <laughs> we also found old technical drawings of our root beer mugs showing the exact proportions needed to remain strong through consistent washing and handling. And yes, many of those are stolen today, so that's OK. We're good with that. Um, speaking about mugs, I could spend probably all day showing you numerous designs. Um, that we've had throughout the years. These are some of the oldest ones, and I'll give you a pro tip. If you can find, see the top row? Um, these are called dog-eared handles, and if you can find a dog-eared a w collector mug, buy it, because that's the most rare, the most valuable of all of our mugs. And maybe my favorite um, is our own cave drawings. Um, this looks like chicken scratch. It's actually a written record of every batch of root beer um, made in a small restaurant in Carroll, Iowa. Larry, the owner, um, he is L-A-H, -L -A um, started writing every batch of root beer that he'd made, and it's down a long hall in the back of the restaurant. He also wrote notes about the day. Um, was it hot? Was it busy? Um, and when he ran out of room, because this is just 2015 through 2017, when he ran out of room, he painted over all of it and started over. So we actually had a lot of stories to tell as a brand, but there had been one critical mistake um, that perhaps threatened not only the history, but the ability to tell the brand story. Like many questionable trends, they started in the 1990s and 2000s. <laughs> um, the industry had become transactional. We'd been focusing on speed of service, drive-through times. Um, restaurants, if you don't know, count their profits in pennies, literally pennies. Um, so the opportunity to save labor could mean extra profit. Um, and one of the biggest things about our dispensing equipment was that it was temperamental. The original dispensing arm, the, uh, this draft arm, what we call, um, was very temperamental. Um, so a lot of times um, we had uh, machines that were breaking, and we had fewer and fewer technicians that knew how to fix them. Um, so to help stem the tide of broken equipment, we allowed operators to stop making fresh root beer and instead start flowing it straight through the fountain machine. So we had authenticity as a brand, but we lost it. And the worst piece is going into a restaurant and knowing that you can't get a and root beer at A&W restaurants. Um, so we'd literally taken our most important legacy and given it away, poof, up in smoke. We'd created our own crisis, albeit with good intentions, but consumers rarely remember or even know our good intentions. So we'd forgotten about the basics. So going back to Maslow, his hierarchy, um, we were focusing way too much on the bottom of the funnel. And you guys know, once you start fulfilling the needs, going up the ladder, you're eliciting positive neurological response, all the good brain waves. This is true for all of us. However, it's really easy to be focused on the bottom of the, and I'll give you a couple examples from our brand. Um, 
It's pretty simple. <laughs> um, are you hungry? Here's food. Oh, maybe you don't like burgers. What about chicken? Ours is hand-breaded in restaurants. It's really good. Wait, we're not done yet. Cheese. Everyone loves cheese. And sorry if you don't like cheese. I do not trust you as a human. <laughs> Our cheese curds are made from Wisconsin white cheddar cheese. Um, they're delicious. They're deep fried. They are dusted with a very, very small hint of garlic powder. You don't even taste it. It just makes this super craveable flavor. Um, but we're not going to stop here. We're on a roll. Chocolate shakes. We make our chocolate shakes with Hershey's Special Dark. It's like the most chocolatey shake you'll ever have. Do you like hot dogs? Those are half price on Tuesday. We invented the bacon cheeseburger in 1963. We still have car hops. And don't forget, we have a mascot. Rudy. And as a marketer, these are all valid things to talk about. All of them have merit and complete the picture of who we are as a brand. Um, but me yelling them to you is not a story. I'm trying to sell you, not engage you, and remember what storytelling means. But we had stories to tell. We just had to ask our fans. And they consistently told us all we needed to know. Everywhere we travel with an ANW logo, everywhere we are stopped. Every airport, uh, from a consumer who wants to tell us their a and story. It's pretty amazing, really, sorry. Um, this one, when I was four, I remember every time we went to an a and I would always start yelling, I need a beer, Dad. My dad couldn't resist and would always pull over and get me one. And there were thousands of examples. All we had to do was ask our fans what they remembered of the brand growing up. Best sight, smell, and taste there was. Mugs still adorn the freezer, yes, we know mugs are going to get stolen. It's OK. We've built that into our food cost. <laughs> um, fortunate enough that my son and daughter share this love that I have. And for consumers like this, you can see exactly what makes A&W A&W. We're bringing back their childhood memories. Thank you for not changing the root beer recipe in 100 years. That's the one thing we didn't do. We didn't change the recipe. We changed how it was dispensed. We lost our credibility from consumers not believing it was still fresh, but the recipe had not changed. So why weren't we telling these stories? Why weren't we treating this product with care? No, really, why weren't we telling this story? Our consumers were telling us, this is A&W, this is who you are. So starting back with 15 people in 2011, we started making changes. We converted 100% of our restaurants back to made fresh root beer. Um, this was huge. It's taken years. Um, 2015 was the first year that we could honestly say 100% root beer being made in store still. Uh, we renewed our focus on root beer mugs um, because we were having consumers tell us that it was not a real A&W experience unless they got a frosted mug. We began rolling back out a new draft arm system um, that is less temperamental than the original. Um, and last but not least, we un unleashed our influencers. And this is really big. I could spend all day talking about our influencer campaign. Um, we for influencers. We just have so many people that are passionate about us that we don't have to pay them. Um, so it's a pretty unique model. Um, but we let our influencers tell our story for us. We all know user-generated content is better than anything that we can create and, as marketers. Um, and all of these pictures you'll see, um, you'll see paper cups in some of these pictures. Um, and there's only one day a year we ask our restaurants to use paper, t paper cups, and that's National Root Beer Float Day. We're giving out hundreds and hundreds of free floats, and you just absolutely cannot keep up with washing glass mugs in that situation. So these people look just as happy with their free floats. <laughs> um, but these were pictures from National Root Beer Float Day, a holiday that we celebrated in 2012. We've created um, our own commercials using just pictures from our fans. Um, and this is the, you can clearly see in each picture um, how happy these customers are. They've become brand fans if they weren't already. They're building those positive neurons, uh, neurological response that we've talked about. And um, <laughs> the joy on especially children's faces, if you can tell it's their first time having a root beer or a root beer float, honestly, there's nothing like it. Our fans became literally our best and cutest storytellers. Um, and at any given point, again, we can reach millions of consumers without paying a single dime in media fees. So what did we do? We started telling our root beer story, made fresh and served in a frosted mug. We engaged with our fans to share their stories. 
Um, and this, again, created that positive neurological response. We talk about root beer, frosted mug, that brings up memories, happy times, simpler times. The circle continues. So what did we learn? Trust your gut, period. As humans, we tend to overthink things, but we're inherently very simple. Allowing restaurants to stop making fresh root beer was ultimately a terrible idea. Not only do you trust your gut, like a thousand percent trust your gut. Everybody who worked on those projects probably knew, oh, this doesn't feel right. It was needed at the time. We didn't want to have root beer. Restaurants were running out of root beer. Um, but we let it go way too long. Um, so since our renewed focus on root beer and mugs, a lot about our quality food, what this means for us, we just ended our eighth straight year of same store sale increases. Our average comp sales are up over 38% since 2011. We have 27 of the past 32 quarters positive. And one of the stats that we are most proud of is the fact that we're now over indexing in millennials for a brand that was built from boomers. And that is a huge shift in how we are able to communicate the brands online. Um, even better than that, something we're very proud of, is we are now ranked number one in social media and fast food for brand sentiment. This means consumers like us. We're also ranked number two in the industry in brand passion, only second to Taco Bell, which if you know Taco Bell in the US, it's definitely its own cult <laughs> status. Um, so not only did fans like us, they loved us. This was part of our story. So I'll leave you with this. We always like to say if you like root beer, you will love fresh A&W root beer. What I find most interesting is that for people who don't like root beer, they love fresh root beer. But I think the real human truth is that it is impossible to have a bad day when you've had a root beer float. That is where I will leave you today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. We have some time for some questions. Yay. We have some time for some questions. So you can um, tweet them if you want to um, hashtag TGS underscore AW. Um, or we're also going to have um, mics in the room. So if you're not shy and you just want to ask your question, you can do that too. And I can't see anyone, so. <laughs> Me neither. So you're going to have to like, stand up if you're here in the room. Um, so thank you. I guess one of the questions that I have just to kick it off is you talked um, at the end about um, bridging that millennial mm -hmm. um, focus. And for a brand that was really built on boomers, how are you addressing multiple generations? Um, yeah, so it, it's interesting right now. And we, um, you see this in the work force as well. This is like the first time in history, I think, of US that there's five different generations of people working in the same workforce. Um, so for us, as we're trying to protect you know, our core customer, which is boomers, but also knowing that our boomers are aging out, we need a younger base. So our research was built around trying to find the intersection between baby boomers and millennials and what their likes are. Um, we we established a brand strategy that we called Hip Nostalgia, um, but it was basically using those, uh, uh, talking about that intersection, which uh, millennials love authentic brands. They love original brands. Um, and that's who we were. I mean, we had 100 years of history to pull from. So what we've done really hasn't had been reinventing ourselves. It's looking back into our history and trying to pull back or forward the best of what we've done in the past. Um, and that resonates with millennials just as much as it does with boomers. Do you think that you're building brand um, fanatics as you continue to cross this um, generation divide? Yeah, this is really crazy. Um, you know, we talk about influencers and, um, you know, there's, I think that there's a bubble in terms of payment for brand, you know, brand ambassadors and how much they're charging. Um, for us, most of our brand ambassadors now are really, really young. Um, I mean, you're talking about like 16-year-olds that have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of followers on YouTube. Um, so it's really cool to see younger consumers get really stoked when we send them, you know, swag. That's it. Um, but yeah, I think it definitely resonates with millennials again as much as boomers. 
Can you talk a little bit about the um, philanthropic um, efforts that you've made? Because you've made a really yeah. big um, dent in that. Yeah, this is really important for us. Again, um, the brand, the big boom um, was based on veterans. Um, we were founded at a parade celebrating veterans. Um, so as we were looking at um, you know, our phil uh, philanthropic goals, what do we want to do as a brand, it's really hard to ignore the fact that so many of our franchisees were veterans. Um, so we partnered with um, disabled American veterans. Um, they've been excellent to work with, and they can actually provide $40 in benefits for every dollar that's raised. Um, so that we know that they're you know, good stewards of the money that we're able to donate to them. But all the money that is raised, it's raised from our franchisees, it's raised in the communities that we have restaurants, which is pretty exciting. I mean, um, everybody, you know, dollars add up, so, over the years. Does anyone in the room have a specific question? If not, I can ask all day long. So, thank you. Um, I grew up a as a child having real fond memories of A&W. And I think um, I probably gave up on the brand when you guys were hitting your low point. And as, even as you're talking about it and the whole frosty mug and all that, all of a sudden now the old jingle's coming back yep. in my head. Let's How? go to A&W, yeah. The, the, uh, <laughs> no, the A&W uh, root beer's sorry, got that frosty mug taste. Sorry, you guys see why taste. I didn't make it for American <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but I, the, the thing I was curious about is how do you reconnect with somebody like me who's given up on mm -hmm. the brand because I didn't know that you were making the root beer again and I think yeah. because I had given up on it, I was yeah. out of the loop. Yeah, we have very far to go. Um, one, I mean, still to this day, um, to your point, that was the bottom for us. So, you know, as much as we've accomplished, we know there's still more to coming, uh, coming forward. I think one of the things that I admire most about the a &W brand in Canada, and I've talked to a couple people about this, is they've had very consistent leadership for a very, very, very long time. So they've been able to stick to their brand strategy, um, not have a lot of turnover in the C-suite, um, so that they're able to stick with that message. So my hope going forward is that we're going to be able to continue to expand that and reach more consumers. So we know now, um, because the first couple of years, it was like all we were talking about was millennials. We don't, we don't do that anymore. We talk about Facebook. I mean, there's, millennials aren't on Facebook really anymore. Um, so, but we're still continuing to have that conversation. So we vary the conversation based on the channel that we're having that dialogue. Um, so, but that's very exciting that you were able to share that or that you had that memory. Um, that we're hoping to build that for more people. Fantastic. Um, thank you for sharing the, the U.S. story. I'm curious to know um, why there is a, such a sort of disconnect or difference between U.S. and, and Canada. Um, you know, the Canadian brand is, you know, the whole Beyond Meat and the mm -hmm. new branding approach and product offering. Just curious uh, why that is or what the history is there between sort of the, the border crossing of Canada and U.S. and yeah. the brand? So the Cana uh, A&W started being built in Canada in the 1950s, and then it was spun off in 1972. So we've had a very long time headed a different direction. Um, so that is the biggest thing, is you know, for, the, for the majority of the last you know, several decades, um, we've had different strategies um, in terms of the consumers that we've been targeting, um, I know that you know we've skewed more millennial, um, and I know that um, A and W Canada really does build upon some of the heritage of like the Burger family and stuff like that. Um, and there's definitely a contingent of franchisees um, and team members in the U.S. that would love to go back to that. Uh, but I think that's the biggest difference is we just charted so long ago. Um, but we have taken learnings from Canada. Uh, we introduced the Beyond Burger after um, seeing their success. Obviously, they sold out in like two days or whatever it was. We had to make a phone call and say, hey, can you tell us what happened? Um, and they've been very open and willing to share um, their learnings. So um, the biggest difference between kind of the, where we're located is in the U.S., we're predominantly in small town America, more rural locations, and you don't see as much of a demand for some of those um, kind of marketing messages. Um, we talk about 100% US beef, and that's really important to our consumers. Um, so for us to be able to make some of those claims, we'd have to go outside of 
for, I'm just using beef as an example, we'd have to go outside of the US to secure that beef supply. So that's something, again, we have to manage. Um, again, we're owned by our franchisees, so they're critical also in that decision making. That goes right along with this question that was tweeted. So are you bringing back the vegan burger? Because this person is, life is empty without them. Life is empty. <laughs> uh, I think we have a press release going out on Monday listing all the locations. Um, so it's not mandatory. One of the things in, uh, we use a lot in the US is uh, local store marketing. And we allow restaurants to carry products that might be um, specifically demanded by their consumer or it's important to their region um, from a food perspective. So I think we have over um, let's see, 120, 140 restaurants that are now selling the Beyond Burger in the US. But fun <coughs> fact, um, we started selling Beyond Burger as a, they don't, Beyond Burger doesn't even like you to say vegan because that throws some people off. So a vegetarian option, even though it's a vegan burger patty. But we also launched one with bacon and cheese. <laughs> Because in our test market, we were seeing most consumers, if you were a vegetarian, obviously you want the vegetarian. But we had people that were just curious about the product. Um, but they also want it to taste good. So, uh, so, we have <laughs> uh, so we do sell one that has American cheese and real you know, hickory smoked bacon, um, pork bacon, not fake bacon. And um, it's really interesting to see how consumers um, kind of play between those. So the, we have, we're giving both people an option. Um, either you want to eat less meat or you want to eat no meat. And then what other initiatives are you doing, um, you know, if you have a paper straw initiative, what other initiatives like that are you doing that are working to steward this massive yeah. brand into a new generation? I think one of the biggest things, and this is, this is on me, um, as you look every year and, and what you're going to focus your message around, um, is the next part that we really want to tell our story is about the glass mugs and um, the fact that that was really kind of the original um, reuse, <laughs> recycle program. Uh, we know even though we lose quite a bit of mugs that people steal them um, out of the restaurants, each mug costs about, a two, costs about $2. And each mug will replace approximately 180 paper cups from going to a landfill. So that's been something that we haven't done enough of a, we haven't done a great job telling that story and I think that's next. Because I think that's something, I think we've saved like, you know, hundreds of millions of cups going to the landfill. Um, but we haven't done a great job of probably telling that story. But that's, it's next. Does anybody else have a question in the room? Okay, one awesome. more. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, you? and you brought it up, I think what's um, fascinating, and you were talking about it in the inner sanctum the other day, is that the stores are now being handed down through generations. Oh, yeah, so what does that look like? This is really cool. So um, we are now seeing second, third, and now fourth generation franchisees in the system. Um, it is a, if you own a business, you own a restaurant, uh, you're, you're kind of buying yourself a job, if you will. Um, you've got that stability, but you also have something you can pass down and create generational wealth. Um, so we have restaurants that, there's one, there's one restaurant in uh, Wisconsin that the restaurant itself has been in the exact same location for 80 years, over 80 years. Um, and it's been in the same family for decades. So it's now the granddaughter who's running the business. Um, and then we see that all the time, where it's the grandchild's now taking, you know, the 27, 30 years old, and they're now the owner of the business, which is pretty insane. That also helps us, um, you know, kind of, uh, as as our consumers kind of are aging out, a lot of our franchisees are aging out. So it keeps it in the family business. We, t we tell everyone a and is a family. We didn't make it this far without being a family. So that's really cool. Perfect. And with that, we're out of, out time. of time. So thank you all for coming. And thank you, Sarah, for thank sharing you your story. Thanks.